Carl, good morning. How are we today? We are doing great. How are you guys doing today? Not too bad. Not too bad. I guess the first thing I want to know is not how was Roger Clemens. How was Meg the Stallion last night? My not goodness. Great. Not, not great. That was not a, I would not put that in the highlights. If we're doing a top 10 list of the game last night, <laughs> not sure it makes the list. Not sure what she was actually doing. Uh, I did see her underneath. I mean, the two people I've seen underneath now working on first pitches uh, in my career, and it's been a long one, uh, one was the president of the United States, George Bush, after 9-11, who came out and threw a strike, and he did it uh, very quickly and, and, and literally nailed it. And then there was Megan the Stallion underneath, who was working hard to – throw the ball to somebody who was catching it and never really got it there and then went out on the mound and somehow wanted all of us to, I, I guess, wallow in, in this experience with her. And I'm not sure why, why we were doing that. So that, that was not pitch clock uh, design. That was a frustrating part of it. Well, uh, <laughs> what about uh, Roger Clemens? We were, I was, we were kind of, I was kind of interested to see how he was going to do on a broadcast. You, you never could tell with athletes and how they're going to, you know, how they're yeah. going to be able to analyze the game and give opinions and stuff. How was Roger? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was, um, I would say that I was, I was very pleased with it. Uh, I, we had dinner with him the night before. Wow. Um, you know, look, you're talking about a guy that's, that won seven Cy Youngs. He's, he's behind Cy Young and Walter Johnson on the pitcher uh, career war list, which is now the metric that's often used to kind of assign a player's value. He's third on the list ever as far as pitchers go, and it's not really close. So you are sitting next to one of the greatest to ever do it. You do wonder, is, is he going to make it about himself? Like, how much is he going to actually say? Well, how is this going to go? He seemed very uh, humbled by the experience, uh, seemed to really enjoy the entire process of being on the field, of talking with the managers before the game. I, I think in the end, guys, I think, he, I think he loves to just be in baseball, to talk baseball. He's one of those guys. I'm guessing Nolan Ryan would be the same. They just want to sit and they just want to talk, tell stories, observe. He's very astute. Uh, he knows pitching. He picked up right away on Ryan Presley shaking his arm, which is I'm not sure a lot of people do, but as a pitcher, uh, and the pitcher's out there and he throws a pitch and he's kind of trying to loosen something up. He was all over that. I, I would describe it as a very, very good, positive experience for somebody that's that's not been in a booth before. He was great. It was a lot of fun. Carl, this is kind of a nerdy broadcast question, but we were talking about it with Jeter the other day joining uh, A-Rod. When you're working with Clemens or someone new as a star analyst, how, how do you coach them up or talk to them about saying things? You know, not being generic, risk ticking someone off and getting very critical. How does that work? And, and who have you had those experiences with behind the scenes where they're like, I don't care if I say something, I'm just going to be honest about it. Yeah. Uh, well, my God, I mean, having done baseball tonight for so many years, I, I think I've worked with over 50 different analysts. Yeah. Uh, sitting here doing the games, uh, you know, the, the, my goal is to make them as comfortable as possible, meaning, Roger, th this is going to be a conversation. You know, you don't need to, you don't need to dominate it. This is a conversation. Um, literally, if you can fall back on every one of your experiences and share them with the people at home. Because um, a lot of times the athletes don't even realize uh, that what they have to say is going to be impactful or meaningful to the viewer because they've lived it. Like, well, how's that important? Why would anybody, why would anybody find that interesting? And, and our goal is to make them realize who you are and what your experience have been um, and your ability to relate to what's going on out there with Dylan Cease and what's going on out there with Ronaldo Lopez or Ryan Presley, whoever's on the mound, Jacob deGrom. Um, you know, you are their window. And, again, be as comfortable as you can be. This is a conversation. I, I think that's, that's served me really well over the years is to rely on my analysts and to make them feel like I, I'm as curious as the viewer is at home. I, I feel like I can ask the same questions that somebody sitting at home would ask, and especially when they say something. When Roger says something and I don't quite – either think he's making the point that he wants to make or I don't even understand exactly what he's saying. He talked about the cutouts last night on the infield dirt and Raul Abanez happened to be in the booth with us. And even Raul said, I, I thought he was talking about the infield uh, dirt around the bases when, in fact, he was talking about just the entire infield dirt and given where the bases are 
And uh, is every one of them uniform now? Because you have to have, you know, the infielders need their feet on the dirt. Well, if if some field has dirt deeper than another field, it gives that team an advantage. And I think that's what Clemens was getting at. But Rule said, well, so I thought he was talking about this, and Roger had to clarify it. Make them comfortable. It's only a conversation. This is not your your expertise. You're a player. You did that so well, better than anybody. Uh, now we're inviting you into our world. It's, it's our job to make them comfortable. And he was he was that way. He sat back. I mean, the other part of it is body language. You guys don't get a chance to see. But I mean, he wasn't anxious. You know, he was kind of sitting back in his chair, taking it all in, watching. And and when there was something that that really excited him, he just jumped in. It was, you know, there was there was no yellow light or red light. If he was going, he's going. And I may have been in the middle of the sentence, or or Eduardo, he's going. You know, he's got something. And go ahead, buddy. That no worries on on my end or anyone else's. You didn't have to pull the Kevin Harlan on him. <laughs> No, I didn't hit. No hands went up. He was smuggy. But he's also he's also watched a few games in his day. He knows. Oh boy, Jordan Alvarez just hit one up there. He probably said "Wow" or "Ouch." I mean, one thing about sitting there with him, you recognize, regardless of the Astros or White Sox, when a hitter did something against the pitcher, he didn't like that very much. <laughs> Carl, this is the first Sunday night baseball game coming up this weekend for the Rangers in, uh, I believe it was six or seven years. They haven't been uh, featured a lot, obviously, because of some of their struggles in in recent history. Um, They've loaded up, spent, you know, nearly a billion dollars on contracts over the last couple off seasons, getting Jacob deGrom, getting Marcus Simeon, getting Corey Seager. Where do the Rangers, do you think, fit in the conversation heading into this season of the most intriguing teams, not necessarily that they're all going to put it together and be the best right away, but, but in terms yeah. of the most intriguing teams heading into this year. Yeah. On the interest level they're they're you know, they're up there, um, you know, and I think they probably should, we, we all thought they'd be a little bit better last year. Um, I think the move to bring Bochi in one of the selling points for a guy like that has to be, we are going to do everything we can, meaning we're going to spend a lot of money to be competitive because I, I don't see Bochi you know, getting off of his, whether it's boat, couch, uh, golf course, whatever it is that he, winery, whatever it is that he really likes to do, to come back and be part of a of a team that's not going to be competitive. And it doesn't mean this year that they have to be competitive, but I find the Rangers to be in that same conversation of the Chicago Cubs. There are teams that you look at, and one of the questions we're always asked, okay, well, give us a dark horse. Who could be interesting? The Rangers are that team, uh, partly because of the manager, partly because I think some of the guys last year weren't yet comfortable in in that environment on a new team. Uh, they should hit the crap out of the baseball. They should score a lot. And you bring in a guy like DeGrom, and immediately, if he's healthy, and I know we started this whole segment with you guys talking about Jacob. You know, uh, In the end, did Jacob DeGrom walk off the field on his own terms? And the answer is yes. Did, did he have to walk off with – a trainer? No. That, that's a huge, huge step forward because there's all sorts of anxiety, I still think, and will be when he goes to the mound until he is able to prove he can give you 25 to 30 starts instead of 7 to 10. So that's a huge part of this thing. But, boy, if he's, if he's healthy uh, and he's your leader, you, you certainly are in the conversation with other teams. Their, their biggest challenge are Houston and Seattle. You know, that, that's a problem now because Seattle's really good and Houston obviously is the defending champion and they're they're stacked and they're not even healthy. I mean, last night we watched the game without Altuve and Brantley. Whole different ball game when, when Ronaldo Lopez is, mm-hmm. you know, is facing Yiner Diaz and not Jose Altuve or Michael Brantley. Were you really surprised with DeGrom's struggles yesterday with his line? Not, not really. I mean, you know, look, Day, day two after opening day is always an overreaction type day. Uh, no, I wasn't. The fact that he could throw his pitches and seem to do it pain-free uh, is, is huge. Because uh, there were, they were at-bats, especially against Turner. I know he had the triple, but there were other at-bats where he struck him out and he looked foolish. Uh, Jacob deGrom, when he's right, makes anybody, anybody in the game look foolish. And there were a few of those plate appearances in which the guys walk back and you're like, well, he, he had no chance. <laughs> We've seen Jacob DeGrom at his best, and guys walk back like they have no chance. Dylan Cease was that guy last night for a, a much of the game. The guys had no chance. The swings were awful. 
Uh, he, he retired 19 in a row at one point. That's, that's DeGrom every start when he's right. Carl Ravitch, ESPN. Join us here 105 through the fans. Got the call Rangers, Phillies, Sunday Night Baseball. Um, I wanted to get your take on, on, on around the league yesterday, the new changes and everything. I, I think from baseball, this is the best probably three-week stretch baseball's had in a long time. Yeah, from I Positive PR-wise uh, wise statement. But what? how did you think the changes uh, manifested yesterday on the field? Well, there were, I know this. Um, there were a hell of a lot more stolen base attempts, which is huge. Here's the thing that I observed yesterday calling the game. I observed that the pitch clock was something I didn't even pay much attention to at all. I mean, we, we had to inform the audience of it. Hmm. But that game was played at a pace that I think, and I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm 58. That game was played at a pace and with a Christmas. Uh, and, look, you had two really good starting pitchers, and that always helps, that I, that I grew up with. And I think part of this erosion of popularity of this game has to do with I have two boys who are both in their 20s who grew up watching home runs, strikeouts, three-and-a-half to four-hour games, uh, especially in the Northeast when the Yankees and Red Sox seemingly played every day. Uh, and it's easy to sort of turn on something like that. Like, it is boring. It's not fun. There's not enough action. Uh, if you told one of my kids that somebody once stole 100 bases in a season, they'd be like, get the, get the hell out of here. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's impossible. And, and that, was, that was certainly being done. So in a lot of ways, there's a generation that has been brought up on a game that's really hard to embrace. If now you have a, a four- or five-year-old boy or girl and they start to watch baseball, think about the impact that games that we saw yesterday would have on them. Is it sticky? Will they stick with it because that was a two-and-a-half-hour game? And I saw, you know, Jordan Alvarez hit one to the moon. I saw Trey Turner hit a triple. I saw a number of great defensive plays. Uh, Otani's team loses because uh, of a great play in center field, robbing Mike Trout. Uh, there, there were just a lot of things yesterday that reminded me of this is why people watch baseball. So there's a generation that kind of grew up on a, on a product that wasn't what it should have been. And I think yesterday we we began to get back to that product, which I hope translates into more people being interested and recognizing going to a ball game for two and a half hours, three hours if it is, is an ideal form of entertainment. There's a lot of good stuff that goes on that hasn't been going on. Uh, so those are those are the those are the takeaways. A lot more steals. The pitch clock to me was almost irrelevant. That's the pace that we should be playing at, um, and it wasn't one of those where. Uh, you know, unless there's a pitch clock violation and like in Seattle, the crowd started to get on the pitcher and use, use that pitch clock to get into his head, literally started to count down. Um, that's great. You've got crowd involvement. It's wonderful. Uh, it was, it was a very positive day for those reasons for me. Six o'clock Sunday night, baseball, Carl Ravitch. We'll have the call Rangers. And Let me ask you guys a quick question. You have you have the final four of the women. You have mm -hmm. Swift in there for three days and a Sunday night baseball game and a series. Is there any place to get a seat at a restaurant? Is there a hotel room? Sean's got you covered. Sean does. Carl, if you give the line. if you give your producer we, we've your got cell, the number. I'll get you uh I'll get you the number one steakhouse in, in Dallas and maybe the country. If if you're comfortable with that, my best friend runs the whole thing. I can hook you up. Tonight or tomorrow? We're rolling. Buster Oli and I are rolling down there today. Okay. Uh, it, 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 either one of those two. Maybe tomorrow's easier because actually there's. Well, tonight's the final four, so maybe tonight's easier because the women's final four is playing. So okay. I have to think about what night's better. But if that's a standing offer, it's, I'm all in on it. I just a, can't believe how much stuff's going on there. Yeah, it's a standing offer. I got you covered. We'll put you on hold. And uh, I'll set you up tonight or tomorrow for you and Buster because he's coming on Monday. He's been great to us, and I promise you the meal of your life. Thank you for You're coming on. Anytime, guys. Thank you.